But perhaps the most tangible memento of Cardinal Ludovico Ludovici in Rome is the Church of San Ignazio. It was at the suggestion of his uncle, Pope Gregory XV, that Cardinal Ludovico Ludovici planned the construction of an enormous church on the site of an ancient Roman temple, a Roman temple of Isis. And the purpose was to provide the Collegio Romano with an adequate university church. Well, the Roman college, the Collegio Romano, it owes its origin to St. Ignatius of Loyola. It was founded by him in 1551 as a school of grammar, humanities, Christian doctrine, free of charge. And as such, it became the model for many other schools uh, maintained by the Jesuits. And really, the Collegio Romano itself served as the center for the philosophical, the theological, the scientific training of the Catholic clergy. Well, we've already seen how Pope Gregory XIII, Bon Compagni, uh, financed the reconstruction of this original Ignatian Foundation uh, so that it could house 2,000 students. And those students, once they graduated, would disperse throughout the world um, in service of the Catholic faith. Among the students at the Collegio Romano was the young Alessandro Ludovici, the future Pope Gregory XV. Well, the Collegio Romano continues today, not just the building itself, which houses a secondary school, but it can be seen reincarnated as the Pontifical Gregorian University. Well, for the actual building of San Ignacio, for this new church, several architects were invited to submit plans as candidates. However, the winning project was designed by a Jesuit priest, Orazio Grassi, who was professor of mathematics at the Collegio Romano itself. Well, significant amount of work had to go into actually clearing the terrain of the land, and it was only in August of 1626 that the first foundation stone was laid. Here is a medal which marks or commemorates the foundation of the Church of San Ignacio with St. Ignatius himself on the uh, obverse and Cardinal Ludovico uh, Ludovici uh, trumpeting uh, his association with his uncle Gregory uh, XV. And here is another foundation medal of San Ignacio, also from the year 1626, which directly alludes to the difficulty of the terrain, the sort of shifting sands. However, uh, the determination to uh, set up a eternal home is uh, spelled out clearly here with Cardinal Ludovico Ludovici, the vice Camerlengo, as its author. Well, the construction went pretty well at first, but basically uh, th soon there were delays and it turned out to be yet another of those century-long projects that we've uh, seen. The first setback that the Church of San Ignacio received was, of course, the death of Cardinal Ludovico Ludovici, its patron, uh, prematurely at the age of 37 in the year 1632. Now, for the completion of this church, Cardinal Ludovico Ludovici had set aside a generous endowment of 200,000 scudi in his last testament. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, he was aiming to see the church completed already in the year 1640. That would have been the first centenary of the foundation of the Society of Jesus. Well, it was not to happen, despite the best efforts of his younger brother, Niccolo. Well, the next goal was to open it in time for the holy year 1650. And as it turns out, in the unfinished church, uh, there could be some celebration of the Jubilee year. Well, the interior design really took some doing. And for example, the fresco ceiling, which is magnificent. It shows the apotheosis of St. Ignatius of Loyola and the order that he founded with the four corners of the world, including the Americas. It's a masterpiece uh, by a Jesuit lay brother named Andrea Pozzo. Well, it was inaugurated only in the year 1694. And as far as its consecration is concerned, that came only in May of 1722. Well, buried in this church for a start, are the bodies of two sainted Jesuit scholastics, St. Aloysius Gonzaga and also St. John Berchmans, who died at just age 22. And also buried in the church is a former rector of the Collegio Romano, uh, St. Uh, Robert Bellarmine. But also buried there are the uncle and nephew, Pope Gregory XV and Cardinal Ludovico Ludovici in a tomb, a magnificent tomb, by two of Bernini's uh, pupils that dates to the early 18th century. Here, Gregory XV is shown enthroned in the act of imparting the apostolic blessing, and he's supported by carved figures on the one side, faith, and the other side, munificence. And on the pedestal supporting a statue is a Latin phrase in gold lettering that's tough to translate, but loosely. It says, the one 
set up or established uh, Ignatius for worship, and the other set up worship for Ignatius, uh, referring to Gregory the Fifteenth's canonization of uh, Ignatius and also uh, Ludovico uh, Ludovici's uh, establishment foundation of the Church of San Ignacio. The area of this imposing papal tomb also marks the family crypt of the Bon Compagni Ludovici. Well, after that prolegomena, we're going to shift over to Rome itself, where Anthony Maianlatti and I are stationed in front of San Ignacio, and we're going to talk somewhat expansively about this very important church and, and its larger historical and cultural context. We're here at the Church of San Ignacio uh, of Loyola, dedicated to the, the Jesuit saint whom Gregory the Fifteenth Ludovici uh, himself canonized, and it's a foundation of his nephew, uh, Ludovico Ludovici, Cardinal Ludovico Ludovici. But it's very interesting to me because it backs onto the uh, Bon Compagni uh, Collegio Romano, and it's well, it's an example of patronage. Uh, backing onto each other by pretty much by coincidence, the families had not been joined yet. Exactly, that's one of the strange things about this uh, about this 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 whole city block is that it ends up being uh, the product of one family, but it began as the product of two separate families that eventually merged. And today, the most important part is unquestionably the, the, the Church of Sant'Ignazio because the Collegio Romano, which used to be the main Roman school that taught every young Roman man who wanted to learn. Um, Thousands. Latin and yes. Greek taught here for free, as it said over the front door. Uh, it was a revolution in public education, and it was run by the Jesuits. Obviously, the Jesuits encouraged their best and brightest to go into the, uh, go into the order and, and become Jesuits themselves. But even so, anyone, a clerk, a shopkeeper, could come and learn his letters and get a degree of, of, of learning that he would need to get on with his life. And Gregory the Fifteenth, the future Gregory the Fifteenth, Alessandro Ludovici himself was a student at the Collegio Romano. Oh yes, well, lots of popes in the 17th century were uh, Urban the Eighth, uh, Innocent the Tenth. They all ended up going to this important school and distinguishing themselves there. So this is really an important an important site for the intellectual life mm. and eventually the political life of 17th century Rome. Mm. And it's. It was not a, for something that was ostensibly the chapel of the uh, Collegio Romano. Uh, it's a it's a bit outsized for uh, for a mere chapel. Well, actually, it replaces the original chapel. It, it's on the site of the original chapel, which was smaller, and uh, it, it was completely reconstructed by the architect Orazio Grassi, um, and who's chosen a very ponderous, monumental uh, architectural facade. Uh, what we might think of as the Jesuit style, mm. which is very much taken from the first Jesuit church, the Jesu, mm. not very far away. And in the same way that this is this the facade owes a lot to Vignola's facade for the Jesu, uh, Grassi's, uh, Grassi's facade um, uses the classical orders in a gigantic way uh, with a slightly a slight movement in the facade so that we see we see uh, walls pushing back and pilasters pushing forward mm. so that it's a slightly animated, it's not completely flat and yet it still is rather heavy, rather monumental and, and not what you'd call uh, joyo joyoso, it's, it's not frivolous, it's not, it, it's not full of, full of uh, liveliness unlike the piazza around it which mm. is. But just as that facade of, of, of the Jesu was constructed by uh, Cardinal Alessandro II Farnese, the Gran Cardinale, um, this facade and the church itself were constructed by uh, Cardinal Ludovico Ludovisi, who was consciously modeling himself on this great cardinal of the past, of, who, who had only recently died, but who had died before Cardinal Ludovisi had met him, so he, it was certainly a historical mm -hmm. rather than a personal connection. But he wanted to do establish himself as a great and munificent a donor and patron of art. Mm. Now, one thing that's unusual about it, it's very difficult to, to spot from many of the great hills of Rome because there's no cupola. Yes, that was a, that's a problem. Um, in fact, there are, the Jesuits say that, of course, they just decided for reasons of economy not to build a, a, a cupola, not to build a dome. This isn't true. The, the, the fact is that this church was a little too close to another church and another religious community, the Dominicans at Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, just across the street. 
and in happier times they had built a bridge between the Collegio Romano run by the Jesuits and the Casa Natense Library run by the Dominicans mm. so that the Jesuit students could consult the Dominican Library. Uh, but those doors got slammed shut when the, uh, uh, when, when the Dominicans opened a lawsuit against the, against the Jesuits saying that if the Jesuits built a dome on the top of San Ignacio, they, then, the, then the Dominicans would never get another scrap of sunlight in their cloister. And light rights and air rights in 17th century Rome were a huge point of contention, which is something which seems really modern to us today, but in fact has been an issue in, in urban design and, and construction and just cohabitation in highly built type areas for centuries and centuries. And so in the end, the Pope ruled against the Jesuits, uh, which is unusual because in general, the Popes favor the Jesuits. Um, the old intellectual order of the, of the Dominicans against the new intellectual order of, of the Jesuits. And the Jesuits usually won all the way down the, way down the line, but in this case, the Jesuits lost. And so they were forced to do something even more interesting, which was to commission one of their lay members, uh, Andrea Pozzo, uh, who was a Jesuit who hadn't taken all his final vows but still lived as a Jesuit and who was a brilliant mathematician and painter to paint a false dome on a canvas disc at the crossing of the church. So when you go in and you look, you look up, if you stand in the right place, because you stand in other, pla there are other places, it doesn't work, the perspective is only functional from one point, but if you stand at one right place, the dome rises above you as if it really exists. Mm. Uh, and the same Father, uh, Father Pozzo painted a huge fresco in the ceiling called The Triumph or the Glory of Saint Ignatius in which the saint is rising up to heaven through this enormous arch painted architecture that rises infinitely up into the air and the huge spaces of the fresco carry on the, the, line, the real architectural lines of the church inside. Uh, and again, these, this works if you're standing in one particular place, and if you're standing somewhere else, the whole thing falls apart. But most interestingly, if you stand at, at, in the apse, in the presbytery, where the priests, where the Jesuits themselves are standing and, and talking to the congregation, none of the illusion works. This is because the illusion is only there for the people, there for the, it's very, they're there for the punters, not there for the, not, not there for the people who are in the know. The Jesuits are already convinced of the glory of God. It's the people mm. who need to be he would need to be impressed and overwhelmed mm. by this dazzling, fictive architecture. And so it's also an interesting object lesson, this church, um, in what was truth in the 17th century, because in the end, truth was what the Jesuits said it was. <laughs> There's the, the commemorative medal that um, was coined by uh, Ludovico Ludovisi to, to mark the... Uh, 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 to mark the uh, dedication, plainly has a cupola. So this whole story that this, there was, this is not not mm. to be planned. But it takes, on the other hand, almost a hundred years for the uh, church to be finished. Well, that's because it costs a huge amount of money. Alessandro II Farnese, who is the great cardinal who who finished and paid for the Jesu, spent an absolute fortune on constructing this building, which in all the Jesuits' letters to the Cardinal, are, they refer to it as your church and your temple and the Farnese temple. And in the same way, the Jesuits write to, in exactly the same way, the Jesuits write to Cardinal Ludovico Ludovisi saying, this is your church, your temple, the Ludovisi temple. And so, I mean, the parallel couldn't be clearer. It's an obvious attempt to say, uh, you know, we need a rich patron and you are it. But unfortunately, the Ludovisis had another big, big problem at the same time as they were, as they were building this church. They don't just have a cardinal. They have a prince as well, who's the, who, who is the secular the side of the family, the part that, that ends up being the ancestors of, of, of the prince and princess today, which is, uh, which is Prince, Niccolo Lud uh, prince Niccolo Ludovisi, who is having to show himself as a great Roman prince and is building himself a colossal new palace, uh, which he doesn't get, he, he runs out of money and can't finish. This is a, such a huge drain on the family resources that build it, that the generosity, the, the munificent gesture of building Sant' Ignazio by the mm. Cardinal is undermined and sapped because the Cardinal just has to, has to give a smaller proportion of his income to build this because he has to give a huge amount to mm. the secular side of the family to build the family palace, which ends up never getting built fin finally. It never gets completed and then sold to the Pope and the Ludovisis end up 
buying another palace uh, not far away, but it's, it's, a, it's a failure as a plan. It's mm. a disaster and it's humiliating for them as well. Talk about juggling because the Ludovici in the 17th century are, have this magnificent villa mm -hmm. that they've built a uh, outrageous palazzo that they're mm. trying to build, and then this church as well. It is the most uh, overt example of what Thorsten Veblen would have called conspicuous consumption. It's, it's the desire to consume, obviously, to show off how rich you are. It's that same desire that inspired Agostino Chigi a century before to throw his gold plates in the river uh, during his dinner party, just to show off he, the fact that he could just afford to throw it all away. Um, Unfortunately, in this case, the Ludovisi really overreached themselves. They overextended themselves. And the history of the family is very much the history of massive expenditure, mm. massive collapse, economic collapse, and massive reconstruction, followed by massive overexpenditure, massive collapse. It's, it, it's not a family that ever manages to establish itself on a really solid and continuous economic ground, which is fascinating because many other families try really constantly to enrich themselves and stay rich. And the Ludovisi are pre constantly prepared to put it all on the line for show. And so they're passionate and intense and, and sincere um, sponsors of the Jesuit order, which is also, it, it should be pointed out, the most international order and an evangelizing order that's going out into the East, oh. into, into China and into Japan, and uh, trying to convert these nations uh, into India. St. Francis Xavier, the apostle of India, is, uh, died and is buried in Goa. Um, and so we have not, when we have the Jesuits being supported by Cardinal Ludovisi, that means that for Cardinal Ludovisi, he has his own personal agents in every country in the world. So he is sort of the, the, sub, the center of a massive web of connections that send him not just exotic plants from all over the world to plant in the Ludovisi gardens, uh, but also information. Yes. Uh, he, it's, it, the, the Jesuits provide a kind of diplomatic and spy service for the papacy, uh, which is extremely functional, extremely necessary, and it's Cardinal Ludovisi at the head of that. So that's part of the reason why he's here sponsoring um, sponsoring this church. But the Sign Sigmund Freud said that everything is always overdetermined. In other words, there's never only one reason yes. that, that for, for something to happen. For something to happen, there has to be many, many, many preconditions that exist already. And so we don't just have to say, oh, well, he, the Ludovisi wanted to make themselves look good. They, they did. Or they were passionately devoted to the, the, the Jesuit order and the beliefs of the Jesuit order. They were. Yes. But they were also politically involved in running the church and running yeah. and, and taking the, the information that they got from the Jesuits was a necessary part of that. And also, the, let, let us not forget the Society for the Propagation of the Faith. Oh, which yes. Which is a creation of Gregory the Fifteenth, and yet another way to... Uh, 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 bring in this type of uh, information. Absolutely. I mean, it's all this, this, this whole idea of building a web of connections, contacts, and the passage inf of information, which makes the Vatican uh, mail system the most efficient in Europe mm. and the most effective across the world for it's, many centuries. It's still now, in many respects. Yes, in fact, it's certainly better than the Italian one. Yes. And, but the thi one, one thing, however, though, that would have really slowed things down was the uh, unfortunate fact that uh, Cardinal Ludovico Ludovici himself died just six years after the cornerstone was uh, laid of this. Uh, yes, uh, this is a, this is a church. serious problem. Uh, also, because uh, later on uh, in the agonizingly long history of the construction of this church, the Jesuits got on the wrong side of a subsequent pope who then requisitioned all of the Sicilian jasper columns that had been specially carved to build the church. and use them in other projects. And so the Jesuits, with as much help from the Ludovisi family as, as they could still get, um, had to do what they could. So inside the church, we'll find lots of huge columns that look like they're made of jasper, but were actually just veneered in jasper. And some of them are actually just painted in faux uh, marble, faux stone, um, to imitate real stone, because they just couldn't afford it. There was a colossal money problem. But all of this, all of this confiscation and, and the money problems made this church an empty and rather hollow looking church until the end of the 17th century when uh, the whole thing was finally completed but it was only able to be completed with an infusion of, of money from another source a female sponsor who was uh, Constanza Pamphili the wife 
uh, of, uh, of Prince Ludovisi. Of Niccolo Ludovisi. Of Niccolo yeah. Ludovisi. And she brought her enormous dowry to bear and finished the church. And as a result, she has her crest, which shows the Ludovisi family crest, her husband's crest on one side, and the Pamphili family crest, her father's crest on the other side, which is the, the typical form of a female of a female crest. It's divided in two. Uh, sometimes in the middle, there's a band that has that has the papal mm. uh, that the papal parasol and keys. If both families are papal families, so we have uh, an interesting example of female patronage of art here. Uh, and in fact, usually women only make themselves known in this in this kind of case with their family crests which they put discreetly mm. in some place, usually at the base of the column surrounding the, the, the altarpiece or above the, uh, above, the, above the chapel at the front. But Constanza uh, also gets a huge plaque in what ends up being the Bon Compagno Ludovisi mortuary chapel, the funerary chapel of Gregory XV and Cardinal Ludovico Ludovisi. As you might imagine, we're going to be returning to the Ludovisi at many points in this course, but I do want to note here one final, lasting contribution of Cardinal Ludovico Ludovisi in particular. It has to do with the concept of Episcopal ordination. All bishops in the Catholic Church are deemed as successors of the apostles through an unbroken lineage of ordinations. This is the laying on of hands that goes back to the very beginning of the Church. Now, it may come as a surprising fact that Pope Francis claims his Episcopal lineage through Cardinal Ludovico Ludovisi. Also, so did Benedict XVI, John Paul II, John XXIII, and indeed 95.3% of all living Catholic bishops. Indeed, I think that every pope since Benedict XIII Orsini has traced his line of apostolic succession through Ludovico Ludovisi. Well, this line of succession has a name, and I regret to inform you that it's not called the Ludovisi succession. Instead, it's called the Rebiben succession. That's because the first ring in this chain was Cardinal Scipione Rebiba, elected as bishop in 1541 and created a cardinal in 14 years later in 1555. Now, after extensive research, there is no written record of his Episcopal ordination, so there's no way to know who came before Rebiba. What is known is that Ludovico Ludovisi came very early in this tree of Episcopal ordination that bears Rebiba's name, precisely fifth in direct succession. And as such, Ludovico Ludovisi has a surprising uh, contemporary relevance to the modern Catholic Church.